Mark, you're a full-time John Wesley. Is, is that strange? Do the Mark Topping John Wesley boundaries ever blur? Um, no, I don't think really. I mean, I'm full-time, yes, but not uh, not 24-hour. I'm generally not dressed up as John Wesley, and I travel um, in civvies, as it were, and by train, mm. and uh, don't don't travel the country on horse, um, which would take a good deal longer, of course. But um, someone did ask me the other day after after a, a, an event, they said, you know, do you have a problem with being transported? And I was just about to say, um, well, no, it's fine, actually. I'm generally met at the station and collected. When I realised, because she went on, that she meant being transported, carried away with being John Wesley in character. And although it is very, or can be very involving, and of course you've got to do that to a certain degree to, to make it as real as possible, to be as far as you can be mm. uh, the character you're acting. But... Um, but no, outside of the performance, it's certainly uh, I'm I'm me. You don't find in everyday life perhaps that you react in a John Wesley way in a particular situation. Well, that would be nice in some ways. I think he had a he <laughs> had a an ability to, particularly in terms of forgiveness and um, cheerfulness, and um, just he was a, a loving character. Mm. I think certainly towards the end of his life. I mean, this sort of grew with him I think um, that would be nice and certainly in terms of speaking though I, I do find every now and then because I'm I've, there are a lot of Wesley sort of works and words going around my head I end up sometimes coming out with things and I think hang on that was a bit of John Wesley construction or vocabulary and not, and not mine but yeah Has the research that you've done changed your opinion of John Wesley? Yes it has I mean um, when I first began to to get involved in the whole John Wesley history and the origins of Methodism, um, I was definitely of the view that, as I think a lot of people are, that John Wesley was this cold, ruthless, um, distant character mm. and um, not particularly attractive individual in a way. But the more I, I've read about him and by him, I've come to appreciate that he, that's just not true. Um, he have I've got a, developed I suppose a particular respect for his his um, ability to 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 remain focused on what he sees as central in in the gospel in Christianity and also to to break through social conventions in order to to remain focused on that not to, not to be carried away by well for instance um, he was originally and understandably given the culture so opposed to lay people preaching. And he was a high church Anglican and did everything by the book. But he breaks out of that and has um, lay preachers. And then he goes beyond that and says women preachers as well. And that was un would have been unheard of in Anglican circles. And there would have been resistance to it. But he thinks and manages to realise that, no, you are called by God as you have a special call. And uh, so he's not constrained mm -hmm. um, by the, what would, would have limited other people, I think. And I think I just appreciate more his... Um, Certainly, in his, in his sort of the second half of his life, this this growing um, depth of of character and love, I think, and inclusion and uh, warmth and humour as well, that I don't think is generally understood. He's often this this very tight, feelingless, repre repressed person, and uh, that doesn't uh, no, that crumbles as soon as you start looking into it. So, was there a development of some kind? Yes, I think um, there was, and that's, this is one thing that's really come out for me in, in looking at the material. It's often understood that Wesley, although he was an Anglican priest, uh, the key moment in his life was his heartwarming experience in 1738, and after which point he never looked back and went on was this wonderful outdoor preacher. I think that's just not accurate enough, really, because he had a conversion, you know, he committed his life to God at about the age of 21, I would say, when he's preparing for ordination as a deacon. He just mm. says, you know, I've decided that there was no point giving my whole, all my thoughts and words and actions, even my life to God, if I did not give my heart as well. And, you know, that's, that's, that was an important step for him. Okay, it was some years later that he had this other, what you might call, what is often called his um, evangelical conversion, when he has his heartwarming mm. experience, he realises that God loves him. And he, he doesn't have to earn his place in heaven. 
that is an important moment. But still, for a year after that, he's dithering around. It's only a year later that he begins to preach in the open air. And then I, I would say almost there was like a third conversion, um, which happens f- somewhere over a period of ten years, so that maybe by the end of his by the end of his forties, he's got a different approach. He begins to have this um, more inclusive, tolerant, loving, forgiving, jovial approach. I mean, after his conversion, he's saying things like after his normally understood evangelical conversion, heartwarming, he says things like, you know, I resolved never to, to laugh or smile again, if possible. He was so serious. Mm. It, towards the end of his life, he is, he, he, people say that they cannot be long in his company without there being a, a hilarity. I mean, he was, a, he was a, a humorist. I mean, you can't, you get that from just reading his journal. There's this humor in every line of it, really. That, that comes over, and it's something that's there at the end, which isn't isn't there at the beginning. And I think that is a really important development which isn't often appreciated. If he was with us today, would he command the same respect and audiences? I think certainly he would if he, if he came back now with the kind of reputation and respect he had in the last few years of his life. Um, and I found that a particular uh, irony, really, uh, and a wonderful irony, because he... Um, you know, as a young man, he began preaching in the open air, partly because he was forced to do so, because pulpits were denied him. Mm-hmm. Um, then he goes and preaches, and Methodist preaching houses are built. Um, and then and he preaches in the open air. Um, but then at the end of his life, he goes to places to preach in the preaching house, and there are so many people that can't fit in the house, they have to preach <laughs> outdoors. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he had and the people who would at one point have stoned him uh, for preaching in the open air, they line the streets to greet him when they know he's coming back. And, and so something extraordinary happened. And it, partly it's the effect that Methodism and the Methodist societies had in transforming people's lives. Mm. Um, but also there's this aura around Wesley, I think, there must have been because of he was clearly a, a mm. special individual. Do you think of him as a visionary? Did he have a, an idea of the future that... Or was he a man of, t- of today, as it were, imp- impressing a new form of religion? Well, it certainly wasn't... He wouldn't have said it was ever a new form of religion. I mean, part of his concern was to to bring back a primitive Christianity, the early mm-hmm. days of Christianity. Let's do... Um, let's live the kind of lives that Christ asked his disciples to. And so he was... Um, that was his drive, as it were. Um, I think he he was a visionary in many ways, this ability to break out of the mould, mm. you know, at a time when slavery, for instance, was widely accepted and people were quite happy to be slave merchants and traders and go to church on a Sunday and even you know, ring the bells in rejoicing when a, a, an anti-slave trade bill was thrown out of Parliament. But Wesley, in his ability to, to remain focused on the central teachings of Jesus, I think, realises that that can't be true. You can't reconcile that with, with the teachings of Christ. Mm-hmm. And so in some ways, he's a visionary. Um, but certainly, it's, it's, perhaps it's just his single-mindedness, his clarity of thinking. Do you think you understand him better by acting him, by taking on that role? Well, I think um, it gives you a, a particular insight, I think. It must do, because you're... I mean, when I first started doing it in costume and in character, giving talks to, to visitors at the New Room in Bristol. Something happened there with regard to the way it was received. I mean, I was giving talks, the same talk, more or less, to start with. But when I changed the pronoun and said, I came to Bristol and I did this and this is why I did this, it, it sort of brings it alive a bit more, um, certainly for, for, the, for the listener. Um, but also for me... The more I've done it, I think, well, I've got to make, give an, as honest an account I can of Wesley. And so I've got to somehow try to understand, not just to understand the facts of what happened where, but what made him tick. We, we have his written words to go on, and I think quite a few of them. Do we know anything about his style of delivery? Were there any contemporaries who wrote about the way that he was uh, putting it over, the way, the, the way that he presented things? Yes, I mean, he, he claims to have had this... And, and eyewitness accounts back this up, that he had quite a flat preaching delivery. He was against the paddling of the hands, as he called it, and felt he should just speak plainly. He did have his notes on pronunciation and gesture. 
um, which he distributed. Um, some people said it was as if he was reading, just reading it out. So if he'd done it many times, he was very fast. Right. Um, sometimes that he was a bit of a, an actor, you know, that he, it was, um, was not genuine. No, so he doesn't sound like he was the greatest orator of his time in terms of a performance. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, and yet there was a tremendous effect to when he did preach. Um, but I think perhaps one of the, the most important things for him is not just his preaching, which made people want to respond, it was what he did with it afterwards. He formed yeah. people into little yeah. societies and took it on. That was part of his genius, was to actually order the societies which he established um, and take them on and nurture them. Uh, so rather he, he, than was simply a, he was a doer as well as a preacher? Yeah, he didn't just preach a, a great sermon, he, he, he right. followed it up. I mean, yes. he says this, I think, that, that he resolved never to, to um, preach somewhere where he couldn't actually follow it up. Right. Yeah. He, he's been spoken of as being autocratic, uh, was he? Yes, he was, I'm sure he was, I and mean, that's how he, he ran the whole thing. It depended upon him um, to operate in the way it did, but to criticise him for it, it, it's slightly unfair because it's like putting democratic values, you know, on, on what he did, and it's not fair. <laughs> this is, we're 300 years ahead now, and um, certainly by the lights he had, you know, he, he made a pretty good job of it. But yeah, he was an autocrat, but it's, 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 it's not as um, such an awful sin as it might be today, I think, mm. given the fact that the style of things would be done differently. Was he a good communicator? Did he listen as well as preach? Well, he was hugely opinionated on just about everything. You know, he had strong views and published them, um, and generally, I'm sure, got his way. But he he was a listener and had to be, I think, to survive. Um, he had a... I mean, he had to, to, to communicate. I mean, he uh, communicated effectively mm. to thousands of people who he had little in common with. I mean, he was highly educated, highly articulated, and he was speaking to to miners and sailors and people who were, who were pos quite possibly illiterate and um, badly disposed towards them, and yet somehow he made contact with them. Yeah. So a great communicator. And also his ability to deal with the mobs, I think, shows that he had, he was listening on one level, he had a, this intuition as to what might happen, how best to deal with the mob, yeah. at what moment to say what. Um, and that accounts, I'm sure, for his, his survival at the hands of some pretty ugly um, rioters. Yeah. What were his relationships with women? Did he treat them as equals or were they... And, you know, did well, society preclude that perhaps at the time? He has a, hu a very high respect for women um, and I think certainly above what was the norm for his day um, and this no doubt has something to do with the influence of his mm. mother in his life. I mean he was home educated in effect up to the age of 10 by his mum. Um, living in this house with a brother and loads of sisters. And um, so that, her influence was, was powerful. And certainly he, he did, he um, encouraged a number of women who he thought had a call from God to preach. And that was against every rule in the book and would have had a lot of resistance. <laughs> it's only fairly recently, of course, that, that women have been accepted in the Church of England at, at a high level. So mm. it's taken a long time for that to happen even now, hasn't it? Well, it, it has, though. The, the, uh, the <coughs> sad thing in Methodist Church was that after Wesley died, it didn't take long for the Methodists to ban women preachers. Mm -hmm. And it then took another 150 years before they were accepted again. Yeah. But uh, certainly, as far as Wesley went, it was um, something he, he saw and encouraged. I understand his relationships with women weren't always successful. That's right. He he's famously has disastrous relationships. You know, he wants to and doesn't want to and can't make up his mind about a, a woman in, in um, Georgia, in America, and then she marries someone else and it, it all get, turns horribly uh, messy. And he comes back to England then. But I think it's unfair because, to a certain degree, it's, you know, a lot of people try having, yeah. have mess have a mess in their relationship. But because there's so much about Wesley and so many people looked at him, you can say, oh, well, he messed this up, messed that up, what an awkward person, how what a difficult character to be married to. But there's, the, he was going to marry and wanted to marry, and she wanted to marry him, Grace Murray. 
she he travelled with her, her for a long time. They spent a lot of time in each other's company. She was proven um, value to him in his work and, and as a as a class leader. Um, but he was thwarted in doing it by his brother, who tricked her in effect. That's probably a nicer way of putting it. But his brother was against it, probably because she was of a working class. Well, definitely, that was his stated reason. He thought it would be a scandal. He went and got hold of her, whisked her away, convinced her that John would never wanted anything more to do with her, and married her off to someone else the next day. And John was devastated. You know, his one chance of, uh, mm. of happiness. You know, he says, I can forgive, but who can redress the wrong? You know, so I think he had as fair a chance as anybody of having a, of a happy married life. Mm. Subsequently, on the rebound, you might call it, he marries someone who turns out to be not really compatible with him. And it was, yes, disastrous, and they were separated, and it was, it was an unhappy mm. match. But, but I don't think he's particularly unusual. He's a fascinating historic figure. Does he still have relevance today? Yeah, that's one of the things, I think, which has, has struck me from when I've given a, a presentation on Wesley and perhaps his slavery sermon. You mm -hmm. could easily say, well, it's a kind of dated thing. But one of the most common responses is how relevant it is today. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it ties in so well with fair trade. I mean, his thoughts on war as well. I mean, you can't hear those. You think... They must have been written for now, for the current mm. situation. Um, they're so relevant that you think well, it's, it's extraordinary. So yes, I think definitely, and certainly with regard to, as well to his his um, call, really, for people to follow Christ. And I think that mm. that's always relevant. So his ethics and his values are as relevant today as they were then. Yeah, most certainly. I think it's it's not it's not just a what what I do when I go around churches. It's not it's not just a historical curiosity this is what he was like and though those were the times it actually has a sort of you know it connects with where people are now in some ways I mean mm. it is partly looking at our our roots and where we've come from and if we're to understand where we're going to go but but it does uh, I think part of it is there's a direct link and a direct relevance yeah how is John Wesley received in the churches that you go to very well I mean it, it is for for a lot of Methodists I think News, you know, I mean, a, lot, a lot of Methodists don't know an awful lot about the origins of Methodism, mm. or some. I mean, some I know don't necessarily or aren't quite sure about the difference between John and Charles, who is who. And so it's, it is a useful exercise mm. for people to, to look again at where do we come from, what were they on about, particularly at a time when the church is thinking, where are we going now? How do we, mm. uh, how do we? take things on from here and it's always worth looking at, at where you've come from. John Wesley was an Anglican. Why briefly did he start the Methodist movement? Well, I mean he was in a way was trying to rejuvenate the Church of England from within and he never left the Church of England. I mean he mm. might have done things which were quite irregular, but he said, you know, right up to his dying day that did mm. not separate from the church. So I think he could probably see that it was an inevitable thing given the the, the breadth of the uh, community, the, the society which he was presiding over. And there were people within that, members of the society, who weren't Anglicans, never had been, and weren't particularly warmly disposed towards it. Um, so he had his own prayer book, he'd done his own ordinations, etc. So it was almost inevitable that it was going to carry on. But it was not his original intention. It was, a, it was a, mm. an attempt to rejuvenate from within. What, was his, what were his views on, on Mass and Communion, if he was trying to simplify things? Well, yeah, that's interesting, because he, um, yes, the, the Holy Communion, or, or the Sacrament of the Last Supper, as he, he often referred to it, which was this sharing of bread and wine which Jesus wanted his friends to do after his death, that was one of the, the very first things he did, was to say we must go to Communion on a regular basis, not, not just an optional once or mm -hmm. twice a year thing. If we're taking our religion and our faith seriously, that's go to, to church and, and observe this command, as it were. But it was doing this on a weekly basis which got him a lot of, of uh, well, a, a lot of antipathy. A lot of the opposition seemed to, to focus on that. And he was accused of, of being a, a Jesuit or a Catholic or a Jacobite sympathiser, not just an enthusiast. But there must be something wrong with this kind of uh, concentration on, on going to to communion in this way. But very often the, the people he'd encouraged to go to communion at, at church were then turned away by a, a priest who thought, well, we don't know who you are, 
mm. go away. You're probably one of these followers of John Wesley. And so we talked earlier about the, the separate, you know, the, the Methodist Church breaking from the Anglican Church. Well, that's the beginnings of it in many ways. Yeah. When, when people are turned away and they had to, began to, to celebrate communion in their own buildings, ultimately. Some fascinating details. Thank you very much indeed for your time and your enthusiasm. Thank you.